This week's episode of the FOSPOD is all about network attached storage. It's time to get our NAS on. Look, man, I don't know what kind of lifestyle you're living, but every week is NAS time around here. It's time to get nasty. What? No. Whoa, 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 man. It's a new podcast, okay? We have to ease them in. We're going to replicate the hell out of all your terabytes. Wait, hang on. Okay, I only, I only have one question here. Are we, are we doing terabytes or tebitbytes? Oh, just play the music. Welcome to the FOSPOD. I'm Will. I am Brad. Hey, Brad. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm feeling free and open. How are you? You know, I'm feeling more free and open right now than I do any other time during the week. Uh, I'm I'm really excited about this week's topic, too. Yes, people who know us know this is a substantial part of our free time. Well, it's it's kind of where we started with the tech pod, and we haven't talked about it much in the last two years. So I'm excited to kind of dig back in and start with the fundamentals and then build up to where I think people want to go. So so we're going to talk about a couple of different things here. We're going to talk about why why you would want a NAS. Mm-hmm. Why, why you want storage attached to your to your home network, uh, the upsides, the downsides, things that are good, things that are bad. We're going to get into the different options that are out there from like some closed source stuff that you can just buy off the shelf all the way through your heavy hitters like your true NAS and your open open media, open media vault, open. Thank you. Open media vault. The OMV. The, the, look, the OMV is no, nothing's more hardcore than the OMV, it turns out. Uh, and then we're going to talk about like the things you need to know before you start. So yes. uh, kind of where to kick off and and how to avoid making mistakes early on that will haunt you down the road. Uh, you know, I will just say up front real fast, like f- building my true NAS machine for about four years ago was like quite literally the gateway drug that got me into the kind of false obsession that I entertain to this day. Like it's been the thing that got me into the command line that got me looking at all these different open source projects that I could be putting to use for myself. Like it's kind of. It was the thing that kicked this whole thing off for me. So it feels like to me a good place to start. Yeah. And 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 it's it's funny. It's because it's, I had the similar path, right? Like I learned I had run Linux and stuff before I, I built my first NAS machine, but I hadn't really engaged with command line stuff all that much with the command line software all that much. And it turned out to be really, really important to me personally and professionally. So here we are. Uh, as always, uh, the FOSPOD is brought to you by Google Open Source, bringing all the value of open source to Google and all the resources of Google to open source. You can find out more at opensource.google. Dot. Dot Google. Dot, dot what? No, it's just dot Google. We're going to do this every week. Uh, also, a bit of housekeeping. We are hiring. Uh, so we have an editor uh, position that we're looking to, for, to fill on a contract basis. It's a biweekly, you know, one show every other week, because that's how often we do the show. And we also are looking for a host slash producer, somebody who can join us on the microphone and talk about topics of interest to the open source community. Uh, the email address for both of those CVs is fospod at content.town. So send them in. We're, we're talking to people now. So uh, we're, we're reaching out to people and talking to people and we're excited to meet new people as a result of doing this show. So please, uh, again, it's fospod at content.town to send your, your CVs. I think without any further ado, we should get into why people would want a NAS, Brad. Because it's rad. <laughs> so it's because it's a lot of fun. I mean, that's not the best reason, but like... <laughs> genuinely enjoy tinkering with it like nothing else but like yeah we should start with practical benefits for people who aren't lunatics like us so okay let me step back the the basic definition of a nas a network attached storage device for people who don't know is exactly what the name sounds like it is just a storage volume sitting on your network that any other device on your network that's on your wi-fi on your wired ethernet uh, can access so it's storage independent of a kind of end user device like a laptop or a phone or a desktop pc uh, that can just be shared by everybody in the house so the classic example I always give is that when I worked my first IT job working in an office, there was a, a person who had shared their hard drive with the Windows hard drive sharing thing, and everybody else in the department needed a file that was on that hard drive. So when she went on vacation one week, everybody's like, hey, I can't get to this drive. And we had to, it took us ages to track down which machine was the one that somebody was hosting their own files on. When you have a NAS server set up in your house or in your small business, whatever, you avoid this problem because that machine's designed to be always on and it's designed to just basically serve files and do other things. The, the other kind of secret cool thing that, you, that having a, an always on machine uh, in your house gives you is the ability to have software that runs all the time uh, and and do things like, you know, 
host a media server so you can share ripped DVDs or ripped Blu-rays, uh, run a VPN so you can get into your house from outside, wherever you are and where, wherever you happen to be, uh, run game servers or things like um, like Internet of Things server, like Home Assistant, which is a an open source project we'll talk about later that you can use to control lights and and you know smart Internet of Things stuff around your house. There are considerations to doing this. One of them is electricity <laughs> and leaving something on all the time. Like, you know, I know people who just run their Windows machine 24 seven so that it can serve files to the rest of their house. And I'm like, what are you doing? My Windows machine has a giant video card and a huge CPU, and it's it's pr- kind of expensive, it turns out. Right. So so there are options all the way from like a literal hard drive with an Ethernet port in it on up to a Raspberry Pi or an Intel NUC. Are we a NUC or a Nuke podcast? I think we're a NUC is the official pronunciation, as I understand it. NUC, NUC is where I like to land on that one. You know, but yeah, like small, cheap and like low power compute devices like those that you can hook up to one or more hard drives on up to like much bigger, like full ATX PCs running pretty heavy duty kind of NAS operating systems. Like there's a pretty big spectrum there of hardware and software solutions that we'll get to. But, you know, there are considerations like how much electricity is this going to use if I leave it on 24 seven? So you need to think about like what your needs are, what you're willing to bear there in terms of resource consumption and stuff like that. And kind of a lot to dig into there. Well, also with a 24 seven machine, a machine that's going to be running 24 seven, 365 days a year, like the spinning drives last a finite time. And you're looking, in my experience, between three and five years, you need to think about replacing all of those disks. In one way, this is kind of nice because it means that, you know, you buy disks and you look at the amount of space you're using and you're like, okay, this is going to last me for the next three years. And then you know that you're going to upgrade and there will be theoretically larger disks available at that time at the same or less less cost. And then something like a pandemic happens and the cost of disks go way up and you're sitting here thinking, oh, well, I could just buy replacement disks that are exactly the same size as what I have. Why am I spending $1,000 every three years on disks? This, this, it gets kind of expensive pretty quickly. So it's, it's, it's something to consider before you jump into this. And there, there are, I think when we did this two years ago, two and a half years ago with the, with the first TechPod episodes, we had kind of jumped into the deep end because there weren't a lot of other options available at the time that were compelling or, or they were limited in some important way. And now it's a little bit of a different story. Yeah, like the, the, the spread in product availability has gotten much better. Uh, there are a lot more inexpensive and simpler options out there. Also, before we get into that stuff, like I, I also feel like it's kind of interesting. There is a philosophical split, a schism, if you will, Uh-oh. where I feel like one group of people is very much moving back toward local data storage, wanting their own me- media like music and, and movie library, wanting to manage everything on site again. And there's a whole other category of people who are like, get hard drives out of my house. I'm just going to use cloud storage for everything now. I don't want to think about this anymore. So like there is something to think about there about whether you want to get into this, because I think it's a lot of fun and it empowers you in a lot of cool ways. Um, But if you're the type of person who wants fewer boxes around the house, you know, there are online options that can do some similar stuff, but it's 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 a it's a very different use case and philosophy depending on what you're looking for. But if you're looking for backups and like photo photo backup, photo sharing services, those things are available, you know, whether it's Google Photos or the iCloud Photos or whatever, whatever your phone provides or uh, for cloud backup solutions like Backblaze is a, is a great service that will keep your data safe online without you having to have a bunch of external drives around the house. If you're looking to serve media, it's a little harder because like the cost per terabyte is really, really high once you get above about two terabytes on most of the cloud storage providers. And they can't interface directly with with most um, media server software like your Plexes or your Cody's or whatever. Yeah. So it's an interesting balance. I think for our purposes, I think there's two kind of two kind of people that we're doing this episode for. One is somebody who's curious about a NAS and wants to kind of get dip their toes in, but maybe not spend a whole bunch of money, maybe even use hardware that's around. And one of the things that's interesting about that is the Raspberry Pi, the rise of the powerful Raspberry Pi over the last five years means that you can get a multi-core Raspberry Pi 4 with what, like four gigs of memory, theoretically for under $100? <laughs> theoretically, yes. The prices are a little bit jacked. Like you have yeah. to pre-order them right now just yeah. because they're in such high demand. The current situation, this is pretty much the worst possible time to be building something like this. But in an ideal world, yes. SBCs, I guess is the generic term, small board computers for things like Pies. I mean, that's the most popular, obviously. Like very inexpensive. Yeah. You know, like you, you can get a $35 Raspberry Pi 4 theoretically, when the prices normalize again, it'll do everything basic that you could want a NAS to do. Well, and I was able to find places to pre-order Pi 4s that would deliver them in two to four weeks. Uh, so th- like they're not impossible to get. You just have to wait a little bit at that retail price. Uh, don't go to Amazon or Newegg and buy them because the prices are marked up in- incredibly right now on 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 Pi 4s, especially. 
Um, but but yeah, if you put um, one of our options that we'll talk about in a little bit is is Open Media Vault, and it runs really well on a Pi Four, uh, even even with like Docker containers running underneath it with different services running. So there, there's there's a bunch of interesting options, and you don't have to like take your old gaming computer and strip out the video card to to build a NAS on your on your network these days. That said, if you want to do that, <laughs> you certainly can. Yeah, it's it's definitely a viable path, and it's it's like it's. One of the things we like to do rather than throw old hardware in the landfill is to figure out ways to kind of recycle it or upcycle it or you know whatever your term of choice is. And then that's definitely one of them. Uh, so let's see, downsides, uh, power consumption, uh, depending on where you live and what your per kilowatt hour rate is, you know, a NAS, a heavyweight NAS uh, box running the wrong software can cost 20 or $30 a month to run in power. Uh, the drives have a finite lifespan. We talked about that plan to replace them every three to five years. Yeah, I, I want to jump back in about the power usage. I mean, you're not wrong. Like, that's substantial. But something hit me when you were talking about Backblaze earlier, which is that for small amounts of data, stuff like Backblaze is great. But yes, once you get up into the pricing tiers that where you'd be storing the same amount of data that you might put on a local NAS, the monthly cost of doing that on a service like Backblaze, I think, probably far exceeds what your electricity is going to run. Well, the Backblaze backup service is um, is infinite for storage, for backup. That's for desktops. For desktops. If you're if you're using their data container services, it gets really expensive above about two terabytes. Yeah. And if you've taken, you know, taken efforts to reduce your uh, power usage from the grid, if you have solar panels or wind generation or something like that, the cost of running the NAS come, you know, you, you take that off the top, I think, probably. Um, there's a lot of time. Like it's, it takes a fair amount of time to get up and running and then a little bit of time regularly for maintenance. Uh, one of the things about putting an um, always on machine, especially if you choose to make it accessible outside the network, the, the outside of your LAN, is that you're adding a massive amount of threat profile to your home network. And, and as a result, you know, you need to run software updates and you need to run security patches and you need to update the services that you use and all of the things that kind of Windows takes care of for you. You you might have to do that yourself on on a on a NAS box, which I personally find to be kind of relaxing. I mean, you know, that's that's upkeep that some people might not want to deal with. Like it's kind of a once a month, once every two months, depending on the cadence, just kind of a cup of coffee on a, on a Saturday morning and SSH into three or four Raspberry Pis and just run some updates. You know, it's it's not huge, but it is something to consider. It's it's kind of analogous to changing your oil in a car, right? Sure. Like you 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 get up in the morning, you grab your cup of coffee, you sit down at the chair, you shell into the into the NAS, and then you apt get update all. That's right. And you know got, you got to stick the dipstick into the package manager, see what comes out. <laughs> the way I would phrase it is, there is a little bit of a hobbyist element to this stuff for me. Like I think you do kind of need to enjoy it a little bit to truly dig into the stuff and keep up with it. And it's also a vector to learn about things you might not learn about otherwise. Like I learned more about configuring uh, file sharing for Windows machines yes. by figuring out how to how to get that running in FreeNAS 10 years ago than anything else I've done as a, as running Windows machines for professionally even. So yeah, it's an opportunity for you to learn how to do shell scripts, how to do all sorts of other um, kind of stuff that's like, it's, it's an entry point into the world of IT administration if that's a place you want to go with your career even. Or even just stuff you want to know about on the back end, even if you don't want to work in that field necessarily. Like I've learned so much about just basic networking and file sharing, like file systems, different backup methods. You know, I've kind of gained a better understanding of like what GitHub best practices are, you know, like how are repos managed? You know, what is a pull request? Like I didn't know what any of that stuff was before I got into this and I'm no programmer. But all of those things are so adjacent to this type of project that like you just kind of the osmosis sets in and you just start learning. And it's a, it's a great feeling. So. Um, the interesting thing is we both kind of started in the same place with the, the NAS as a media server slash like file depository for the house. Yeah. You know, I used to back up my laptops to my, to my NAS, um, stuff like that. If you've ever suffered catastrophic data loss in your life, you know how terrible it is. And that's happened to me a couple of times. And finally I was just like, you know what? I'm going to build a thing that's got some redundancy built into it where a single hard drive failing can't hose years worth of data as has happened to me in the past. And so like, that's kind of how I got there. Like that is actually a pretty uh, significant use case or, or justification for doing something like this is like it's some resilience to data that might actually be like very important to you. That is the right reason to start, right? Is, hey, I use a laptop as my main computer. I carry it out of my house every single day. The data on that laptop is incredibly at, at incredibly high risk. Like you leave the laptop on the bus, you somebody steals it, you drop it. The SSD is soldered to the motherboard now. Like there's no data recovery for a broken laptop uh, if you don't have it backed up. So, so, so 
the interesting thing is you've taken you and I have taken kind of different paths with with our NAS. Mine is pretty much a straight media box. I store old photos. I have like my my music collection. I have ripped Blu-rays and DVDs. I have um, stuff that I pulled off of the DVR. But other than that, it's it's pretty much it's pretty low traffic. It's pretty much me putting files on there occasionally and then small amounts of data being pulled off and backups running every night from the from the local other local machines. Uh, you've gone a little heavier than I have. Yes. And kind of other occupations that I have, uh, audio and video stuff is a pretty big deal. So having a place to put large media files that are recordings, you know, like they are source files of audio and video stuff that need to be available at all times and accessed quickly. So, you know, there, yeah, there are ways, there are ways to, to build a NAS for, for capacity or for performance or for redundancy. Those things to a large degree are kind of mutually exclusive. You kind of have to make trade-offs there about like, do I want more storage space? Do I want it to be able to survive more drive failures? Do I want it to serve media faster? You know, there, there are a lot of considerations there. The interesting thing for me is that I'm getting ready to upgrade my NAS or upgrade my NAS hardware. And I want to go a little bit lighter. I want to use a little bit less power. I want to have something that's a little bit easier to manage. I want to have something that I spend, generally speaking, less time fooling with and more time just using. And I'm okay. I'm willing to sacrifice some power to do that. Uh, Whereas you're in a situation where you're actually using a lot of compute on your on your NAS and you also have uh, high throughput needs and and other like a kind of a complicated workflow at this point. You know, Will, if I, if I didn't know better, I would say this sounds like what we in the business call a segue into our next section about different NAS options. Okay. There are a bunch of different options here. Boy, howdy, are there? Yeah, you, like you can install Ubuntu or Debian on a computer of some kind and just turn on SMB and SIFS, the file sharing formats for Windows, and bam, you have a NAS server right there. Yeah. Although everything you described takes a certain amount of foreknowledge, let's be clear. <laughs> it's not an easy path. Those those are Linux. You know, I, I, I this is something I'd love to hear from people about, like what level of sort of Linux and, and kind of FOSS proficiency people are working with. Those are, you know, Ubuntu and Debian are two of the more popular uh, Linux distros out there. But that is just inst- installing flat, just a full on Linux distro with no uh, usability tools on top of it is what you're describing. there. So like you absolutely can do that. But that is a that's a rabbit hole if you don't have a lot of command line and Linux experience. It's both hard to set up and difficult to maintain, which is kind of two disqualifying things for me. So I'm <laughs> yeah. going to say, let's not talk about like, while you can absolutely install Linux on any computer and turn it into a server with like a few shell scripts and a little bit of foreknowledge, we're going to assume that people want something that's a little bit more managed for, yeah. for our purposes. TrueNAS is the classic example it used to be known as FreeNAS, uh, is a BSD based ZFS file system, massive it's kind of the the grandfather of this entire of, of like the home NAS enthusiast community. It's been around forever. ZFS is an incredibly resilient and like full featured file system, but it came out of the server world. And so it comes with some pretty hefty uh, hardware requirements, particularly in terms of how much memory it needs. Um, so for basic home needs for, say, backing up a photo library or just the, you know, even a Plex library, like just the standard home use cases, TrueNAS and ZFS maybe can be a little heavy and a little bit much. If you're doing stuff where resilience really matters, where, say, transferring massive terabytes of data around with a single command is important, then it's much more uh, appropriate in that context. But it's kind of like, it's the thing I started with, but it's the thing that I would probably recommend people get to last in their sort of as they climb the the ladder of of NAS options, it's like it's the it's the deepest rabbit hole and like one of the more fully featured options. But it is quite a lot to get into. Well, I was going to say I, I have a friend who's a professional nature photographer, and he goes and you know, goes on trips around the world, generates terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of raw photos, and he has both a portable NAS that he that he backs up the files to at the end of the day, and then that syncs across the internet to his NAS at home. And he has, you know, 50 terabytes of storage in that NAS at home. Like he's a perfect use case for true NAS. Absolutely. Right. It's, it's a thing where redundancy is important. The things that he's backing up are irreplaceable and he's interested in both redundancy and security and performance, all, all three of those. Cause he works off of the actual NAS. I don't have that level of data security or, 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 or um, speed required to stream the lion King into my living room. Well, Will, you're in luck. We have some lighter weight options for you. That sounds fantastic. I think we said it, but just to be clear, you also are running a TrueNAS machine as of now, but you're looking to scale down because like you said, your needs are lighter. 
And you can save on electricity. You can save on complexity by moving to... I think Open Media Vault is... A, so Open Media Vault is kind of the... Um, it's a Linux-based uh, Linux based distro based on Debian uh, that basically is like a managed application that lives on top of the, the Linux OS. And you can install it any number of different ways. You can install Ras- Raspberry Pi OS onto a Raspberry Pi and then pull down the packages for the Open Media Vault uh, software on top of that. Basically, what it does is gives you a web-based UI that you can use to control the the guts of the NAS, the NAS parts of the of the system, and also it will handle like the things like the upgrading Debian for you, so you get security patches and stuff like that. Uh, TrueNAS has a similar web web-based UI for the for the front end. I think that's f- for me that web component is actually really important because it means that people who aren't proficient or comfortable working in the shell can do all the things that they need to do to set up the machine, keep it running, add new functionality. And like, like that adding new functionality part is the exciting part about doing uh, an open source NAS to me. You know, you can you can go out, you can buy a Synology box for a few hundred bucks, slam some hard drives in there and install a Plex plugin and three other things. But when you get to the point, you're like, man, I'd really love to run a Quake server on this, right? My, my kids got into Minecraft and I want to run a Minecraft server at home. You know, your options are a little bit more limited on the closed source uh, solutions. So yeah, there are those turnkey boxes out there, Synology and QNAP and, and there's a bunch of others. Yeah. They are a lot more just kind of ready to go out of the box to be clear. I mean, those are basically little enclosures that you just plug some hard drives into and they've got their own proprietary uh, operating systems that you also access over a web interface. And like, you know, it's that classic trade off, right. Of they're a lot easier to just unbox and get going, but also, you know, you're, you're going to pay a little bit more for the amount of compute power you're getting in them than you would building an open box. Uh, also, you know, you're subject to the decisions and the policies that uh, are set by those companies, you know, for, you know, feature support and, and that kind of thing. The software that they provide is very much designed by them, not sort of designed by committee and more open uh, like you get in the open source world. And also, if you're buying something that's that is a very common piece of hardware, then it, the threat profile for that gets higher, the more popular the hardware gets. So we've seen uh, some NAS specific malware out there that's like ransomware that 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 encrypts your NAS drives and requires you to pay some somebody some Bitcoin to unlock your business, which is never never what you want, right? It's right. never a good outcome. So, uh, so we're looking we're going to talk about mostly True NAS and Open Media Vault today. I think they're both extensible. You can both add, add plugins or uh, in the form of either plugins in True NAS's case or Docker containers in in Open Media Vault's case. Uh, that add functionality and like other types of servers underneath your your server. They, they handle the maintenance for you. They handle a lot of the maintenance for you. So you don't have to worry as much about updating and and things like that. You can hit a button in a web interface instead of having to run command line uh, and, and update stuff manually. And like we said, there are a bunch of alternatives. If you just want backup, a cloud-based backup is probably better for you than, or, or an external hard drive might be better for you than a NAS if you only have one computer. If you have a bunch of computers and a bunch of phones and stuff that you want to back up, then, then that's when you start thinking about the NAS. For file sharing, uh, the cloud services like Google Drive and Dropbox and OneDrive are really competitive up until up, up until you get beyond about two terabytes, it seems like. And then and then the cost per terabyte goes way, way up compared to what you can get in a, in a box that lives inside your network. Uh, and the other nice thing about the internal network is if you are on a provider, internet provider that provides limited upstream, then you're not gated by the upstream performance of your home internet connection. That's a good point. I mean, that is like that problem is endemic, especially in the United States. I don't know if it's as bad elsewhere, but upstream speeds are, I have to assume, artificially suppressed. I mean, maybe there are legitimate reasons that are not business reasons, but like it's in a lot of localities, it is very hard to get very fast upstream for fast uploads to something like a cloud storage bucket of sorts, right? You know, you might have downstream that's like tens of times faster than your upstream. And so at that point, uploads of, you know, backups of terabytes of data just aren't even practical from a time standpoint. 200 megabits per second down and 10 megabits per second up is an is a really common uh, internet speed in the US. So uh, so that's those are kind of the options. That's kind of what's out there. Um, we're going to talk about TrueNAS and Open Media Vault. You can get real complicated and hybridize and do things like run your software on a small nuke machine and run the storage in a Synology NAS. And you can you can do you can kind of jam these things together in all sorts of different ways. We're going to hit kind of the more common approaches. Okay, so we've decided we want to do a managed install, mm-hmm. some sort of operating system, uh, either TrueNAS or Open Media Vault. I think we should start with Open Media Vault because it's kind of the the slightly less deep entry point. 
Also, it's Linux based, which has a lot of advantages we'll get into. It's a little bit easier to set up and install. If you have a Raspberry Pi laying around, you can hook that up to an external hard drive and have like a tester. A, hey, do I, do I really need a NAS NAS uh, for probably stuff that you have in your house already would be my guess. The installation process is very straightforward. You get downloaded an ISO from their website. You uh, either burn it onto a USB thumb drive or burn it onto a CD if you still have a CD burner. <laughs> And uh, then you just boot off of the boot the machine off of that thumb drive and and go from there. So you've gotten hands on with Open Media Vault. I'm, I mean, I'm way down the true NAS rabbit hole, but like you've gone kind of gone through this process. Would you describe it as pretty user friendly to go through that installation setup? I thought I had a Raspberry Pi 4 laying around that I could use to do this, and I actually didn't. But I did uh, set it up on a VM inside my Windows machine just to kind of test everything. Not to derail the conversation. You've just given me an idea, which is maybe <laughs> maybe it's worth having a cold spare raspberry pi around at all times. So I, I literally have one on order that'll be here in march so yeah i'm starting to feel like maybe a plus one raspberry pi strategy might be good to have just like because because you know the, the in the in normal non-price inflation times like they're like what the basic model is 35 bucks right the two gig memory one is 35 dollars yeah having one around not doing anything at all times is pretty handy just to, in case you have an idea and want to try something like this and it's not like they'll conk out over time right uh, if it's sitting in the box so uh, the things I really like about Open Media Vault is it's it's pretty lightweight. It's Linux Linux based, so you get your power management and the kind of the the kind of things you expect from a modern operating system. The web interface is really robust, and I was able to do everything I needed to do to maintain the system from in, inside that web interface uh, using their OS installer uh, ISO. Not not doing the install Debian first, then upgrade the Debian to have Open Media Vault on top using apt-get. The plugin infrastructure, because you can just download Docker images and run Docker images, it's incredibly like there are so many options out there. We'll talk about TrueNAS's plugins in a little bit, but the Docker images gives you a much easier path to building your own. If the default Docker images don't do what you want or don't behave in a way you want, it's pretty straightforward for you to set one up yourself if you're so inclined. Yeah, I, I don't think I can overstate how much more robust the Linux ecosystem is at this point. No matter your level of experience uh, as a listener with the free and open source world, you know exactly how big Linux is because it basically rules the world. I mean, it runs the world at this point. There is just tremendously more stuff available to run on it. Uh, and getting that stuff working is tremendously more, I guess, compatible is the way I would put it. A lot of the projects that we'll talk about, like in this episode or even going forward in future episodes, are also available for free at FreeBSD, which TrueNAS is based on. But like, you know, there's always going to be the risk that like, oh, some library is not quite compatible and it's like you're going to run into some esoteric problem or you might not be able to get run to run at all. Or a lot of projects just are not available on the FreeBSD side. So so having 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 a NAS that runs Linux and has Docker support and, you know, uses the most common tools and platforms that the most people are using is going to guarantee way more software availability. And in a more timely manner too. Like yes. often you, you I notice that things on the, on the true NAS side would lag behind a release or two sometimes, which is, which is usually fine. My Plex client is constantly saying, Hey, there's a server update. You should go get it. And I'm like, no, it hasn't been added to the free PST package manager yet. I can't actually do that. Well, so we'll talk about that more in the TrueNAS side, but I I found that the plugin infrastructure on TrueNAS was frustrating enough and limited enough that I often would just rebuild plugin functionality in jails on my own. Yes. Um, but but uh, yeah, on the Open Media Vault side, the web interface is great. You can set up new shares. You can uh, combine drives. You can turn on RAID. You can do all the things you would expect to without having to touch a shell at all once you get the OS installed. And the OS install process was answering, I think, seven questions, bo booting off of a thumb drive, uh, answering seven or eight questions, and then moving forward. Now, the hardware best practices for, uh, well, we'll get into the best practices for where to install this stuff. Because like, the weird thing about a lot of these NAS OSs is you can you you install them from a thumb drive, but you also are often recommended to install them to a thumb drive. Mm -hmm. Um, there's pros and cons to that, you know, the, the right cycle, the number of right cycles that most SD memory flash memory can handle is, is fairly limited. And, uh, if you're writing, say log files to those thumb drives, you'll burn out the drives in a year or two, if you're not careful or, or even yeah, faster, depending on what you're doing. I, I would say, so yes, the running true NAS off of uh, USB thumb drives was the kind of best practice for years and years. I'd say that's kind of finally sort of been deprecated. 
like SSDs, like legit SSDs are getting cheap enough at this point that you can actually just get a couple of SSDs for this purpose for not that much more. I bought uh, I bought a couple of 120 gig SSDs for like 20 bucks a piece that I run my TrueNAS install off of now. So SD cards and USB thumb drives generally are just pretty poor at resilience over time. The the SSD solution is is good because the thing to remember about these OSs is they're small. You know, yeah. uh, um, the the TrueNAS install is I think 18 gigs or something like that. It, it, it's 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 negligible. Uh, the Open Media Vault install was very small too. I think it was two two gigs total or something. But yeah, I haven't run it on production hardware yet. That's my next step for the Open Media Vault. Uh, but I'm. Uh, really excited the, getting the Docker images up and running took about five minutes Okay, and I can just, I can grab the images, upload them to the machine and they're then, and, and set them to run. And then they just run, which is amazing. So does, does OMV have any kind of central repository of its own kind of one click install, like click here to install the Plex Docker image, or do you have to go out and do you have to get the, the images yourself? I mean, it sounds like even if that's the case, that's not that difficult, but the repository that it has built in is a little more limited it's like things that you would use to manage the server maybe rather than uh, necessarily like your, your full fledged, Hey, here are all the applications you might want to run. But one of the things you can add is a third party repository that adds Docker support and then uh, adds a handful of other utilities on top of that. So there's a plugin that, vi- that backups, backs up all of the config files for the entire thing. And we'll let you share that with, save that wherever you want. Here's a SCSI over ethernet. <laughs> Uh, plug in if you want you know, to do that. You know, everybody's most common use case. Yeah, you can remote mount remote. You, here's a plugin that lets you mount remote shares. So if you wanted to do the thing like I was talking about and have a dedicated NAS box with hard drives in it and mount the shares from that as file system here, there's a plugin for that. So you don't have to you don't have to fool with with uh, f stab files and stuff like that. Right. But, you know, like there are bajillion Docker resources out there at this point. Like if you just want to go see like, hey, what are some containers I can run here on this new thing I've set up? And like you want to run a Minecraft server for people or like, you know, Plex or whatever kind of thing you're looking for. It's it's nigh infinite. I, I think, yes, going to Google and typing kind of Docker and whatever you're looking for is probably enough to get you started. There's a lot out there. And the nice thing about the way Docker works is you can actually like if you have, say, a home assistant plugin that you need to connect to like a Z wave radio so that it can control your light bulbs. That's an option too. Like you, you have access to those resources, those hardware resources from inside the Docker containers. So that's, that's kind of the high level on open media vault. I think, I think really if people want to start out, the best thing to do is to order a, a, a raspberry Pi four, wait three weeks or a month for it to get here. Uh, put it on the plug, plug an external hard drive into the, into this and set it up. Now it will, you'll lose whatever is currently on that external hard drive. So you want to either start with a fresh external hard drive or back up whatever's on the external hard drive before you turn into the NAS box because open media vault will reformat it when you plug it in and, and, and set up the new drive. But it's, it's a, it's a good way to get your feet wet before you get into the, the deep end with, uh, with true NAS. Wait, are we doing it? Is it time? Are we descending the rabbit hole? Yeah. Th- so let's go one layer deeper. Let's peel the onion one more time and see uh, what's going on with TrueNAS these days, Brad. Yeah. So, so TrueNAS, uh, well, so there's been some rebranding there. I mean, some of the information, if you start Googling, is going to maybe be a little confusing because they rebranded from FreeNAS to TrueNAS about a year ago, I want to say at this point. Maybe, maybe a little more than that. Yeah. A year and a half, something like that. The current consumer product is currently called TrueNAS Core. They do have like a, a true TrueNAS Enterprise that is for straight up large corporations, but the free open source downloadable, just anybody can get it and run it uh, version that is based on FreeBSD is TrueNAS Core. And the install process is similar to Open Media Vault, right? You download it, burn it to a thumb drive, put it in a machine and and install the install the NAS software on the machine on whatever machine. Uh, so the single biggest selling point of using TrueNAS is that it allows you to use ZFS, which is a really advanced file system that came out of the server world um, that, like I said, it's got pretty heavy memory requirements. You're going to need like a bare minimum of eight gigabytes of memory for any heavy duty storage you're doing. Well, and the memory requirements go up the more storage space you add to your drive pool, right? To a degree for a home NAS, you're probably going to be looking at maybe 16 gigabytes at least if you really want good performance there. Also, I should just go ahead and mention here for the sake of clarity that uh, TrueNAS is meant to be run on a full-size x86 computer. You know, that's a, an Intel, you know, Core i5 or a Ryzen of some sort, but it is not lightweight like Open Media Vault or um, other kind of Linux-based solutions. It will not run on a Raspberry Pi. You can technically run it on a small x86 box like a, like an Intel NUC, 
But even that is maybe a little dicey in terms of how many hard drives you can hook up and, and the kind of horsepower you're going to be working with. It's SureNAS really is meant to be put on a full size computer. And that's part of where those kind of hefty electricity requirements come in. And so, as we've said, uh, the biggest reason to use TrueNAS is as a vehicle for using ZFS as your file system. The single biggest advantage of ZFS is that it, it really emphasizes resilience. It allows you to snapshot entire file systems uh, and essentially keep a copy of them in the background as they change, and you can roll back to previous snapshots. It makes it really easy to send snapshots to other drives or other storage pools or devices on your network. Does, does that also let you go back? Like if you want to find the version of a file from like three weeks ago, you can go back in time and get the version of that file from three weeks ago? Absolutely. And like I ended up like when I, like I said, it's been a deep rabbit hole. Like I learned how to do all that stuff from the command line in FreeBSD originally, but uh, they have since rolled out the option to merge that with, for example, if you share sharing over SMB from a TrueNAS machine to Windows. SIFs, yeah. Standard Windows file sharing stuff, right? Uh, in File Explorer, that the ZFS snapshots now show up as the, I think they in Windows is called Shadow Copies, is that right? Shadow Copies is the Windows feature, yeah. You can get properties on a folder in Windows and just hit the previous versions tab and it will just list out every snapshot of that folder you have as previous dates. You can literally just open one of those as another file explorer window uh, that has has those previous versions of the files. If you've deleted something, you can go back and get it. Snapshots also make it really easy to back up kind of in mass. It's a very powerful system if you really want to make sure you're not going to lose any data. Uh, it is a lot to learn, though. Well, and it's a lot of overhead. Like like you need a real computer. You, you're not going to run this on a on a lightweight embedded you know NAS box. You, you want to have multiple cores and a bunch of memory. The, but the other things that drew me to True, True NAS early on were jails. Well, jails and plugins, kind of two sides of the same coin. I think in the in the True NAS parlance, uh, a plugin really is just a jail underneath. So a, a jail is a form of container that is native to FreeBSD. Uh, I think most people know about virtual machines at this point. Docker is another example of containerization. So the, basically, the key difference between virtual machines or virtualization and containerization is that VMs replicate an entire hardware stack from the very basic level up, right? VMs run their own kernel. They are a fully self-contained, sandboxed, virtual computer. Containers run on the system host, like they run on the kernel of the host. They share resources. They're much lower overhead and more performant, although not that VMs are like not performant, but containers are more lightweight in terms of resources, but they do exist within the kind of uh, ecosystem of the host that they run on. They just use kind of namespacing and other sorts of sandboxing features to kind of make them discrete from the host. When you run PSAUX on um, on a FreeBSD machine that has jails running, you see the processes that are running inside those jails if you're on the root machine. Yes, but if you go inside the jail, inside the jail, the jail thinks it's just a computer unto itself with nothing happening outside of it. It's kind of a fascinating model. But yes, at the host level, you'll see everything that's running on every jail in the machine. Well, but the so the upshot is you can set up if you have, say, five applications that you want to run on your NAS machine, like a game server, a, a media server, a print server, uh, stuff like that. Then you set up a jail for each one and then each of those is maintained independently and you can turn them on and off as needed. Right. Yes. So in, in FreeBSD slash TrueNAS land, that's how you would approach kind of discrete system services like that. You know, Docker does replicate that kind of same functionality with a slightly different paradigm uh, in something like Open Media Vault. You can do other cool stuff with containers, like you can assign them their own network IPs, uh, and then you know you can even map their names to a local domain on your on your network. You can do like .lan for stuff, so you could go to like plex.lan could be the address for your plex. Wait, wait, wait! You're a .lan? Yeah, I'm a .local. Well, .local is kind of the industry standard, but that's two syllables. That's two okay, more fair. <laughs> fair. Look, you make a good point. Do you want to type five characters or do you want to type three? Fair. I, now I'm going to have to change everything. But yeah, like, you know, abstracting services out to little containers has a lot of cool advantages like that. You know, like they exist as like separate machines on your network as well as separate little virtual uh, computers on the host. Yeah. On top of all those benefits, I mean, the actual secret real reason to prefer uh, using containers uh, for putting all your little services in containers is that it protects you from screwing anything up because each container is its own little self-contained computer. And like, you know, you can spin a new one up whenever you feel like it. If you mess something up in there, you can kind of just delete it and start over. You can clone them uh, if you want to try something uh, and that may not work. And then you can just delete that clone and, and go back to where you were. They are just a sandbox way, especially when you're starting out. And I cannot stress this enough. If you don't have a lot of experience, uh, you know, at a bash prompt or with open source stuff in general, like it's just the best safety net you can have really to be able to create a fake computer that you can then dive into and just tinker around with and not worry too much about messing up the host because you can just 
you know, hose that container and make a new one whenever you feel like it. It's, I, I highly recommend it, whatever kind of paradigm you're working with, whether it's jails or Docker, or there are plenty of other container solutions uh, in Linux as well. Uh, but if you're really trying to get your feet wet with, with this stuff, it's just, it's a, a fantastic way to have some peace of mind as you poke at stuff and sort of figure out how everything works without worrying that you're going to, you know, create a lot of work for yourself by ending up in a situation where you have to say, wipe the entire TrueNAS install or Open Media Vault or whatever your OS is, you know, from the ground up because you did something on the host that you can't recover from. Jails and TrueNAS are one way to do that. Docker and Linux-based solutions are another. There are a bunch of different container solutions out there. Uh, and jails, jails are basically full FreeBSD machines. So like you kind of do need to know what you're doing at the command line for the most part to take advantage of that stuff. But once you do, you can follow basic how to install processes for whatever service you want to add and yes. and and run through the shell scripts pretty easily, is yeah. my experience. Like just generally speaking, the the kind of pros of TrueNAS are that it's incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. You could do a lot with it. Uh it is a real performance hog. It's kind of bad on power management. Uh, FreeBS, the current version of TrueNAS is better than the previous ones have been, but it 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 does have a tendency to run your CPU at basically full speed all the time because uh, it doesn't use the internal power. BSD is not as good at internal power management as Linux and Windows are. Yeah. Generally speaking, if you know how to set it up and do a good job setting up, you can get unbelievable performance out of it. Yes. If you do not, you can really, really hamper your ability to get good performance out of the machine. And you may find yourself rebuilding this a couple of times before you get it right, in my experience. Yes, like it's very easy to make mistakes, like laying out your drive arrangement as you, like when you make a ZFS volume for the first time, there are a ton of considerations there about like, do I want to make this a RAID Z situation where I can lose one or two or even three drives and not lose my data? But there are parity requirements there. Do I want to do mirrors? Like there's a lot there like that you really need to be ready to kind of educate yourself on to try to not to make too many mistakes up front. There's a couple of things to think about, and this is a good place to talk about this. There's, there's the idea of data redundancy, which means that a drive can fail and your array, your your system stays up. You don't lose any data when one drive fails. Uh, there's backing up, which is often the better choice, like doing an offsite backup for uh, your your network attached storage takes two times the number of drives or two times the, the total amount of storage. But if you're not writing to the NAS constantly, losing a day's worth of data is not that big a deal for most people. Um, cause usually in that one day, it'll still be saved someplace else. The, the, the thing to, the thing to remember always is that, uh, data redundancy is not equal to backup. Right. Yes. That is, that is a mantra you will hear all the time. If you get deep into you know, the kind of NAS world is, is, is rate is not backup. Yeah. And, and what that means is if, for example, you have a virus on your computer at home and that virus hits your NAS and deletes all the files on your NAS, having redundant data a re a redundant storage on the NAS won't necessarily prevent you from losing data in that case. Now with true NAS and ZFS, if you have the snapshot set up, right, you'll just roll back to a previous snapshot. It's not a big deal, but don't treat a NAS as backup unless it is actually backup, unless you're keeping copies of data on your local machines and the NAS that, that at that point it is backup. Right. RAID is to a degree resilient to hardware failure. You know, there are, like I said, there are arrangements that will allow you to lose one or more drives and keep your data, but then you're in a degraded state where you've got to add a new drive and there are increased stresses on the remaining drives as you rebuild. Something else can go wrong there. Like it's still a single point of failure. Like that's really what it is, is having one, even if it's a bunch of drives, it's one entity that is a single point of failure. And just having a second copy of any important data backed up is, is still critical because uh, things can still go wrong. OK, so now I think is a good time to talk about like what what's going on in the in the true nas world there's there's true nas core which is bsd based so that's this is why i stress the true nas core name because they are actually ix systems is, is the is the company that primarily uh runs true nas although it is open source anybody can contribute to it so there is a linux based version of true nas forthcoming called true nas scale i haven't tried it yet because it's still in release candidate phase it's not quite ready to go yet and i'm not <laughs> not quite ready to run pre-release software on a crucial storage box right now. Yeah, just to be clear, when you're setting up your NAS, you usually go for the stable long-term version, not the cutting edge version is my advice. The, the, the building a NAS is when I started learning to value the uptime number over the version number. Yes. Like, you know, I'm going to resist. I'm going to resist updating every single time a new version or feature comes out. You update when needed, not when not yes. when available. So... Uh, ZFS has been essentially available and production ready in the FreeBSD world for years. It is built into the kernel. It's like ready to go. It's considered rock solid. Um, 
That has not been the case in the Linux world where there are license incompatibilities between the Linux kernel and ZFS that prevent it from becoming part of the kernel tree. Uh, and so ZFS is incredibly fully featured and mature now on Linux, but it's still kind of this like, it does not enjoy a most favored nation status as a file system, let's say, um, where it is an add-on. It is something you have to add. So it's basically something that IX is doing themselves. They're integrating ZFS for Linux into the TrueNAS framework. So essentially the upshot is it's going to be a Linux based version of TrueNAS. And so you're going to get Kubernetes and Docker support with that, which aren't available on the BSD side. Right. Yeah. So that goes back to that software compatibility thing I was talking about is that there's just the ease of finding services and, and applications that you want to run is so much greater on Linux that I think this is probably going to be a pretty big boon to the TrueNAS world. Just to give a super quick example, just to illustrate the point, back early in the pandemic, I wanted to run a Terraria server for some friends on my TrueNAS machine. Terraria, if you're not familiar with it, is basically 2D Minecraft. Um, but uh, I went to see if I could set that Terraria server up uh, on the TrueNAS box, which is FreeBSD, and it turned out that Mono, the framework that Terraria is built on, uh, does not exist for FreeBSD, at least not a current version uh, that's required to run a, a Terraria server. On Linux, that's just trivial. Like that that's essentially the platform where that is probably the best supported or it's one of. So just, just one example out of probably many where it's just like, oh, this is dead simple to set up in Linux because the support is there, the development resources are there, and it just doesn't exist for FreeBSD. So that's one of the big reasons that I think TrueNAS scale is is pretty exciting. But for the time being, they're saying that both versions are going to coexist side by side, depending on what your needs are. Okay. Uh, but if you do end up tumbling down this rabbit hole, a true NAS scale is something that's worth keeping an eye on as it as it matures over the coming months. I'm really like true NAS scale is kind of the 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 maybe the best best of both worlds for yeah. somebody in my position where I want something that's a little bit lighter weight, but also I, I do like having the snapshots on ZFS and I do like the ability to roll back old files is yeah, it turns being out being really able to roll back and grab a file that I shouldn't have deleted that I just got a little too antsy and was like, I'm not going to need this anymore and tossed it. And six hours later, I was like, boy, I wish I still had that file. Like, that's a great feeling to know, like, oh, I can still go get that. OK, so, Brad, if you want to get started with TrueNAS, what do you do? Just download the latest version from their website. Would you would you start with the Linux version now or would you go stick with core for the time being? If you want to get started with TrueNAS, step one, take a deep breath. <gasps> step two, uh, I, I would absolutely not start with TrueNAS scale unless you're just incredibly brave. I mean, like I said, it is a pre-release version of the software. They have not put out a full production ready version yet. TrueNAS core is still the place to start if you want to give it a try. Head to the TrueNAS site, download the install image of the latest version and give it a shot. But Grab your Bellina etcher and burn it to a USB thumb drive. Yeah. And they've got, you know, there are blogs and stuff out there you can Google up that have pretty good uh, recommendations for hardware configurations, specs and stuff like that. And like it's, I would say if you're looking at TrueNAS, you know, give some of that stuff a read before you do get into it because you will get some insight into like how big of a, you know, how much CPU do I need? How much memory do I need? And like that might be uh, a decision making factor. Well, and the other thing I would say is with TrueNAS, especially since it's been around for a really long time, when you Google, when you're Googling to find answers about TrueNAS, make sure you include the current, ver the version number you're using. Yeah. Because you'll, you will find, uh, you'll, you'll find answers to questions from 10 or 12 years ago at this, at some, in some cases with TrueNAS. So the, there is one more higher degree of difficulty mode. There is another. Uh, Proxmox is a hypervisor. So yes. it's a it's a basically a, an operating system that runs other operating systems underneath it. Mm -hmm. it is, it's it's also Debian based, Debian Linux. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can run VMs in TrueNAS as well, but then you're using the BSD hypervisor, which, you know, it's not super performant, it turns out. Yeah, I mean, people typically, from what I've seen about Proxmox, I have not used it myself, but people tend to do the opposite where they run Proxmox as the host. Like they'll frequently run TrueNAS in a virtual machine inside of Proxmox. They might also run like another Linux in there <laughs> or something. You know, like you can spin up VMs and containers, like I was saying before. There's those, they have slightly different use cases, but Proxmox lets you kind of build a really multifaceted system of computers virtually that are all talking to each other and all performing different, uh, uh, different functions independently. It's a lot. It's a, it's a lot. It's complicated, especially if you're going to try to run TrueNAS, which ZFS requires low level access to the drives. The setup for that is complicated as a result of that. So it, it's definitely a, hey, I know what I'm doing and I want to I'm going to do something that's going to be a pain. But if you if you are doing if you're running, for example, if you want to run Docker containers where performance really matters, you can run a Docker host inside Pro Proxmox and get probably a much better outcome than you would running inside Open Media Vault or definitely within TrueNAS because Docker support and BSD is thin to non-existent. So one of the things that's important about this whole thing, and this is something that 
most people I know that have built their own TrueNAS machine have, find out the hard way is you want to know exactly what you're doing before you start. This isn't a place to just jump in with two feet and start installing stuff and expect it to work out for you. I mean, you could. I'm not speaking from experience or anything, but you could, well, you could give it a shot. Just prepare to make a lot of mistakes. When you the the problem with that out, approach is when you make mistakes, you typically end up having to do reinstalls. So you, you want to make sure you're doing that before you have data. The the thing that I've found that helps more than anything, because the the other big challenge with this is you'll set something up and then it runs perfectly for two years and then something breaks and you have to figure out what went wrong. Um, is that if you document your install process as you're doing the install, so here's the link to the how-to that I used to figure out how to do this. Here's the version of the software that I installed. Here's the dependencies I had to install. And I just copy and paste that stuff out of the terminal or out of the plugin infrastructure or whatever I'm using as I'm doing it and put it into a Google Doc. And then I have that that uh, a tree full of Google Docs for all the different things that are running on my NAS. And when when something inevitably does break, I can open up the folder, search for the thing that I'm looking for, and I and I get all the all the information about it yes. without having to remember what I did two years ago. I have saved PDF versions of some old blogs here and there that seemed like they might go offline at some point just to make sure, absolutely sure, because that was the only place on the internet I could find an answer to the thing I was looking to do. Well, yeah, and a lot a lot of the information about how to do this stuff, especially on the true NAS side, because the the Linux installs are typically pretty well documented. The BSD installs are a little, sometimes a little kludgy. Um, you'll find I found that like the way I would get something to install was by following a path that somebody started on a message board that linked to three different how to's. And you're like, you're it's like you're like a data archaeologist at that point. Uh, trying to trying to find the the one truth of how to install whatever weird library it is you need for the thing that you're looking for. So, yeah, uh, document the main install, document the secondary install. So if you're setting up custom containers, if you're downloading Docker images, save links to those Docker images or maybe just save the Docker images because usually they're not that big. Actually, that you know that's something I was going to say here is you can really avail yourself of a lot of the tools that these NAS systems provide to back up the actual work you've done. So, like, I assume Open Media Vault has similar equivalents like TrueNAS. You can download a single file that is just all of the settings for your entire TrueNAS install. Yeah. So if you, if you lose your TrueNAS boot volume all you have to do is install it fresh on another drive upload that file and it just restores literally everything you had i was looking at a plugin that saves the configuration stuff to google drive so it's just there and you pull it down for the next one yeah that's that's very cool uh so so make documenting the stuff hugely important also especially if you're installing on a thumb drive or an sd card instead of an ssd picking the right sd card is well first off I generally advise against installing on thumb drives. Yes. If you can avoid it, if you have the option to use like a real SSD, I would say uh, absolutely do that in a full size machine. But obviously on like a Raspberry Pi, generally, I mean, there are ways to <laughs> if you really want to get into it. There are other ways, but generally you're limited to SD cards or USB thumb drives. And both yeah. of those are, as we've said, a little flaky. The, well, the one exception, you can get SD cards now that are rated for application use, which means they're they're tuned for both performance and uh, like wear leveling across the whole um, flash for for writes. Generally speaking, the S, the SD cards that are good for application use will have an A1 on them, and they'll be class ten uh, writables, which means that they run at a certain speed and they're they're tuned for wear leveling. Uh, often they're like the ones that you buy for a switch or for, a for a, a handheld handheld device or something like that. They don't cost a whole lot more than regular SD cards. This seems like one of those things that like I had never had flash devices fail until I started using a thumb drive as the, as the boot drive for my, my free NAS box. Yeah. Raspberry Pis are also notorious for killing SD cards. Yeah. If you are going to use SD cards, there will almost always be a point along the, the instru- installation of how to say, Hey, if you're doing this on SD cards, turn off, write lo- log writing to the SD card and write them onto your storage pool or data drive or whatever. Instead, 100% do that or you'll yes. be buying a new SD card in six months or a year. Yes. Google something called log to RAM and follow the instructions. So, yeah. And then the other thing to always, always, always remember is to think about your backup strategy because uh, you're, you're saving important data in another place. You want to back up the stuff that isn't saved elsewhere. Uh, if you're doing like big media, if you're like you're ripping your Blu-ray collection or something like that, you're going to spend an amount of energy, both human energy and electricity doing that math to, to shrink those files down. You don't want to waste that and have to do it again. So so think about your backup strategy for that stuff. You know, Blu-rays can be re-ripped. Like that's just more of your time. 
But, you know, if you're like me, I've got, you know, I've got some like priceless family photos and, and home movies backed up on my NAS and like stuff like that. You know, you do not want to lose that stuff. And so yeah. just just don't go through the catastrophic data loss situations that I have that are very painful. Uh, and just make sure you always have a second copy physically distinct from even something like a NAS that does have some resilience built into it. Well, and and it's, you know, just because you have the file stored on a NAS doesn't mean you can't plug in a big giant external drive to that NAS and, you know, create a snapshot that backs up to that every once in a while or, or whatever for your different data pools. That's a good point about backups. They don't have to be as complex and reliable as your main NAS, your main RAID, whatever. Like, they can be simpler, cheaper, because they they themselves do not have to hold up. It's just one of the two has to hold up, right? For me personally, I'm much more interested in the backup than I am in the redundancy. If my if my server is down for a few days because a drive conks out and I don't have the Plex server up, it's not that big a deal as long as I have a good backup. If I don't have a good backup, then that's bad. The other thing about backups is they don't count until you test them and you know that they work. So uh, make sure that you're actually checking to see that your that your data is backed up. Don't just trust that the process is working. And that's the end of this episode, I guess, Brad. Yeah, we made it. Hey, congratulations. As always, if you want to listen to this podcast, you can find it at fosspod.content.town. This is the last week it's going to be in the tech pod feed. So if you're listening to it in the tech pod feed and you want to hear it in two more weeks when there's another episode, you got to go to the new URL and hit the subscribe button or add us in your favorite podcast client. We should be everywhere now in terms of podcast clients. If if you use a podcast client, and you don't find us when you search, please let us know and we will uh, we will figure out what's going on. Uh, but again, it's fosspod.content.town. Uh, we're hiring. We're looking for both an editor and a host slash producer. If you have either of those skill sets and would like to, to talk about open source software with Brad and me, the, the email address to send your CV to is fosspod at content.town. And uh, as always, the FOSPod is brought to you by Google Open Source bringing all the value of open source to Google and all the resources of Google to open source. It's at opensource.google if you want to find out more information. Uh, That'll do it for us this week, Brad. As always, a pleasure. Thank you. We will be back next week or week after next. That's right. With more FOSPod. Bi-weekly podcast. Did you know that it can mean either now? It's it's look, it's like it's like uh, irregardlessly. Now that's actually a word, even though it's not a word. It's like right there in the dictionary. (laughs) Now You look up bi-weekly and it says twice a week or every other week. Which one was it originally? Are we using it badly? No, we're 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 on it. Okay. Whew.